If you have a dog, you know that they probably should be uh, treated regularly for parasites, and uh, n nematodes such as Toxicara canis are very common and can be certainly harmful to a, a dog and, and be disruptive in the circulatory and lymph system. You may have heard of a drug called Heart Guard that you should give your dog every month, um, and that's to protect against this heartworm called Dirofilaria imidis. And this is, again, another <clears throat> microfilarial worm. When you've heard the filarial worm or microfilarial worm is just their relative size. Um, in a blood smear, they're kind of small, but uh, they certainly can get pretty large. And the reason this is called heartworm is that the adults end up lodging in the, in the heart. And here you can see them uh, in this post-mortem view of a dog's heart where the ventricles are just completely full of these worms and, as you can imagine, easily causing enough obstruction to, to cause the dog's death. Trichinella spiralis is the organism responsible for uh, a disease called trichinosis. And um, here you can see it insisted in animal muscle tissue. So this may be pork. Um, it could potentially even be a human. So um, in the days of, um, you know, early on, and, and even now it's suggested that you cook pork thoroughly as primarily for this particular nematode. And you're going to look at this slide in lab, and I want you to realize that the worms are in cross-section here, right? In order to look at a slide on a compound scope, which transmits light through it, you need a very, very thin slice. So if you take a chunk of muscle tissue and make a very, very thin slice, you're going to slice through a, a worm. So the worm is obviously all coiled up in, in three dimensions and coming in and out. And when you take a slice through it, you may be hitting just a cross section if the worm's kind of coming up out of the slide here or here, right? So here you're hitting it longitudinal and here you're hitting it in cross section. So you have to kind of think of this two dimensional image and relate that back to the three dimensional worm. So again, it's in, in, insisting here. And, and fortunately, trichinosis isn't much of a problem in the US anymore. And, um, and as you imagine, uh, these worms can definitely be problems elsewhere in the world. The life cycles of some nematodes aren't nearly as complicated as some of the platyhelminth life cycles that we looked at, especially for the trematodes. Um, and here, if you start with the insisted trichinella larvae in, um, say, uh, in meat, and if that meat is raw or undercooked and then eaten by a new host, whether it's a human or a pig or other animal, the larvae gets freed from the cyst in the gut matures to adulthood. The adult worms are found in the body of that new host and they'll mate and then they can, um, uh, females will embed in the walls of the small intestine and then larvae gets released and enters the blood or the lymph and uh, for trichinella it ends up um, insisting in the muscle and that can cause lots of pain and dysfunction in the muscles. Unlike some of the other filar filarial worms which tend to just kind of clog up the uh, circulatory or lymph systems. So in lab you either have already or you will be dissecting this uh, parasite called Ascaris, which is one of the larger nematodes. These things are about uh, eight inches long or so. And like this says, this is the most common human parasite, uh, partly because it's so easily transmitted. The eggs of Ascaris are thought to be um, just about everywhere in certain countries of the world. Um, it, it, it's known to affect about 25% of the world's population, and at least 75% of people in, Af in Africa are known to, to carry this parasite. Now, it's not as deadly as malaria and some of the other diseases, um, but it's more common, and it certainly can be quite problematic if it's not kept uh, in control. But some people live with these parasites in their bodies for years and years, which is uh, pretty disturbing, especially when you consider uh, just how big they are. You can see this ruler here. Here's a cross-section through Ascaris. And um, again, as you would expect, a parasite is largely reproductive organ. And these guys are dioecious, so this is a female Ascaris. And again, I'll ask you in lab to uh, be able to identify some of these structures here. Here's the uterus full of eggs. You can see the intestine, which has a flatter shape to it. And um, you can see the dorsal nerve, the ventral nerve, and uh, a number of other structures.
You can tell the male worms because they have this sort of hook-like posterior end with these spicules that are used in copulation. And um, this is an Ascaris, but they have kind of a similar um, copulatory position. Um, again, I want you to, when you do your dissection, to be able to identify the intestine, the genital pore, the vagina, the uterus, which bifurcates into two branches, and then each of those branches leads to oviduct and eventually to ovary. You won't really be able to tell the difference between ovary and oviduct because you'll just see a lot of stringy stuff. And if you dissect a male, which you don't have to, but if you find one and you can, again, you'll see primarily just testes there. And of course, I want you to remember that uh, parasites are highly adapted for reproduction because they need to be able to get more offspring into the next generation. They're highly prolific. They produce tons of eggs. And um, the same kinds of things that we talked about in the past about parasites certainly apply to uh, nematodes as well. So Ascaris has a pretty uh, incredible life cycle, not in terms of having lots of hosts, but in terms of the journey that it can take within a single host. So um, if we start here with uh, swallowing some eggs from an individual somehow, uh, eggs end up reaching the small intestine and hatch. And then um, the, the, the larvae end up taking this incredible journey through the body. Uh, what happens is that they can burrow through the blood vessels in the intestinal wall and that allows them to end up in the circulatory system. Okay, so through the intestinal wall, they end up in the blood in the circulatory system, and they kind of um, will sort of swirl around through the body in the circulatory system. Eventually, they can end up in the lungs, through the capillaries in the lungs. And then um, <clears throat> once they're in the lungs, they can enter into the alveolar spaces, which are uh, pretty small in the lungs. And so a, a, a person who's infected with this is going to end up coughing a lot because you've got this larvae in your lungs and you you cough it up and cough it up because you've got these worms in your lungs and once you cough them up <clears throat> into your throat, making me cough just thinking about it, um, what happens is people often swallow them back down, okay? So the swallowing makes them re-enter the digestive tract. So they go down the esophagus and back into the stomach and back into the intestine. So the larvae reach the intestine for a second time, and then the adults are, are in the intestine, and that's where they're going to copulate, and then the eggs become fertilized, the eggs will eventually be matured and then get released into the feces. And then when they exit the body through the feces, of course, that's when they're in the environment to infect um, water, food, or whatever that may allow a person to pick them up again. So it's really an incredible journey that they take through the human body or the body of any vertebrate host. So kind of gross, but, but fascinating at the same time. I wanted to also include a um, hookworm life cycle for you as well. This is Nicator americanus, which one of the specimens that you have in the lab. And instead of taking the time in this lecture to go through each of these stages, um, you can. I, I'm also posting the PowerPoint. You can take a look at that yourself. You'll see that it's got a pretty similar kind of life cycle as Ascaris.